Welcome to the Cavern webinar, AWS Cloud Adoption, Pacific Dental Services Journey to the Cloud. We still have some people uh, coming on to the webinar, so we'll start in about 90 seconds, so please stand by. Welcome to the Cavern webinar, AWS Cloud Adoption, Pacific Dental Services Journey to the Cloud. We still have people coming online, so we'll start in about 30 seconds or so. Welcome everyone, wherever you are, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening for you, to the AWS Cloud Adoption Pacific Dental Services Journey to the Cloud. We have some really great material for you today, uh, presented first uh, by AWS uh, Architect that I'll introduce, then uh, Pacific Dental Cloud Migration, and then followed by Cavern Cyber Posture Intelligence, how we actually uh, implement what Pacific Dental is using as a service. Uh, our three presenters include Thomas Robinson, Solution Architect at AWS, a lot of operational experience, uh, followed by Nemi George, who is responsible for IT operations and security at Pacific Dental Services. Uh, so for uh, hi Thomas, good morning. Good morning. And Nemi, good morning. Good morning. And then last will be Basham Anat, our Head of uh, Product Management over at uh, Cavern. Good morning, uh, Basham. Okay, so without uh, further ado, uh, we'll turn it over to uh, Thomas. Hi, Dave. Uh, thanks for the intro. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas Robinson. Uh, I'm a Partner Solutions Architect at AWS. Uh, I work with our partners in how they can help our customers adopt or migrate to using cloud services. Uh, before Nemi shares his cloud story, I want to help you understand how you can use AWS services while maintaining a compliant security posture. Managing security is a universal topic for companies moving to the cloud, and we'll cover what you'll need to do from a process as well as a technical perspective to make security a feature, not a hindrance to your cloud adoption. When an organization begins looking at the cloud, I recommend they look at the Cloud Adoption Framework first. The Cloud Adoption Framework organizes guidance into six areas of focus called perspectives. Each perspective covers distinct responsibilities by different stakeholders within your organization. In general, the business, people, and governance perspectives focus on business capabilities, while platform, security, and operations perspectives focus on technical capabilities. Today I'm going to focus on the security perspective, how AWS provides a secure environment, your responsibilities, and how AWS services can be used directly or through your partners to help you build a compliant infrastructure. The security perspective of the Cloud Adoption Framework has four components. Four different controls, starting with directive controls that establish governance, risk, and compliance models the environment will operate in preventative controls, protecting your workloads and mitigating threats and vulnerabilities, detective controls to provide visibility and transparency over your operations, and then responsive controls, driving remediation of any deviations found in the detective controls. I'll touch on each of these throughout my examples. First, to help understand what your compliance model looks like, you should understand what your responsibilities are in the cloud. We use something called the shared responsibility model to define what security features AWS manages for our customers, what our customers are responsible for by implementing into their designs, leveraging an AWS service, or using a partner solution. 
Taking a look at the shared responsibility model, you can see that AWS manages the security of our data centers, the physical and logical separation of compute, storage, and network resources, as well as providing a diverse set of regions and availability zones to ensure our services are resilient. Our customers are responsible for the security of their applications within the cloud. This means ensuring that encryption is enabled where appropriate, operating systems are hardened, network rules are configured securely, user identity and access is properly issued, and the applications themselves uh, are secure and tested. Before we get into fulfilling your responsibilities, you may be curious how AWS attests to our responsibilities and how you can provide that evidence to your auditors. AWS has launched a service which is now available in your management console called AWS Artifact. This service allows you to, on demand, retrieve AWS compliance documentation and agreements. Your governance teams will most likely want to review ISO, PCI, and SOC reports related to our operations, among others. For reports requiring an NDA, you can electronically sign that directly from your console. For questions about specific compliance standards or for addendums to your AWS agreements for things such as GDPR, please check out AWS Artifact as well as our security and compliance page. Now let's talk about what you'll be building in AWS and how to make sure you maintain a compliant infrastructure. I'll use HIPAA as an example. If you're working in healthcare, you're likely familiar with the Business Associates Agreement, and that's available from AWS and covers specific AWS services which are eligible to store protected health information. You can find what AWS services can be used to store, transmit, and process PHI at the link on the slide, and these are also covered under our BAA. While only HIPAA-eligible services can be used to process, store, or transmit PHI, you may use other AWS services that are not HIPAA eligible in your designs for non-PHI purposes. For example, you may want to store logs from your environment in CloudWatch Logs, which is not a HIPAA eligible service, but can be used to store logs not containing PHI. You can review, accept, and track the status of your BAA through the AWS Artifact service. To get started building compliant infrastructure, you can look to AWS Quick Starts. Currently, we have Quick Starts for HIPAA, NIST, and PCI control. We publish these Quick Starts in order to help our customers understand what a compliant infrastructure looks like and understand what specific controls we can help you meet. There are two important parts of this Quick Start, a production-ready cloud formation template and a security controls matrix. The CloudFormation template automatically configures AWS resources and deploys a multi-tier Linux-based web application in a few simple steps, all in about 30 minutes. This is a great starting point for building a service catalog of compliant infrastructure for your teams to deploy. The security controls matrix shows how this template maps to the controls, so you know what controls AWS handles natively, what is managed via the quick start, and what remains for you to solve for. Once you start deploying infrastructure, how do you know what has been deployed as compliant and remains compliant? I'll walk through some AWS services that can help you with making sure this happens. One critical piece of AWS security is AWS CloudTrail, which is a service that captures API calls and account activity, whether that be deploying a new server, changing firewall rules, or changing user permissions. By monitoring and acting on events from CloudTrail, you can maintain infrastructure that meets your requirements 100% of the time, not just when it's deployed or whenever you last scanned it for compliance. So CloudTrail is a great tool for detective controls, but how do we get to the point of taking action? AWS Lambda lets you run code without provisioning or managing servers. This is a variety of use cases, but brings an important capability to compliance by being able to react to CloudTrail events. You can create Lambda functions that will react to events in your CloudTrail logs, scan on regular intervals, or they can be triggered by custom events you send via a simple notification service or other methods. 
This allows you to build a set of security rules without needing to maintain infrastructure. You can define your requirements as code and have that code perform its responsibilities when events happen. Before building a specific example, I wanted to review one last piece that makes building compliant infrastructure easier to manage, and that's tagging. You can attach key value strings to resources such as instances, volumes, and security groups to help organize your resources. This helps for reporting purposes as well as cost optimization, and it also makes applying different security standards to different environments easy. Tags can help you understand what's happened in your resources when they change, but can also be used in preventative controls as well. For the former, you can tag resources as development or production and react differently to changes on those types of resources. For preventative, you can more strictly control access to production resources by setting policies in IAM, preventing users from manually changing production resources that they shouldn't. So let's take all of these services and build some compliance rules around it. One example I like is the creation of firewall rules. Understanding what resources are allowed to communicate with each other over the network is a common target for all compliance programs. AWS provides security groups, network access control lists, and route tables in order to help you control how your resources communicate, and it's important to monitor these configurations. When an engineer adds a rule to a security group, a record like what you see here will appear in your CloudTrail log. It has important information like the account, what region, who performed the change, and the IP addresses they allowed. This information can be passed to a Lambda function where it can analyze what changed in the rule and see if that matches your compliance requirements. In this case, you can see that the rule was changed to allow access to all IP addresses, which is likely something you don't want in a production instance. You can decide from there whether you want to send an alert from that Lambda function, revert the non-compliant change, or even better, do both. Some other examples are tagging data volumes which have PHI or other sensitive data so you can take action if they're launched as unencrypted volumes. Detecting when user permissions are changed and ensuring they aren't overly permissive is another. There's a lot to consider when building a compliant infrastructure, whether that be on-premise or in the cloud. Luckily, you're not the only one solving these challenges and we have great partners like Cavern who work with these services to build offerings that help you meet those requirements. If you're thinking about building compliant workloads in the cloud, look for a partner who has a track record of helping customers maintain their compliance. Now I'm going to hand it over to Nemi George to talk about Pacific Dental Services and their journey to the cloud in a HIPAA regulated environment. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Um, thanks for that. So my name is Nemi George. I look after IT operations and um, security at Pacific Dental Services. Um, a little bit of an, in, an introduction into Pacific Dental Services. Uh, we are one of the largest um, DSOs, that's dental support organizations in the U.S., so we provide a full IT infrastructure stack to dentists, allowing them to focus on dentistry while we provide all of the infrastructure, the IT services that they need to run their business. Um, we started working with Cavern in 2016, uh, with an initial product called ARAP, and we now have the Covering Cyber Posture Intelligence Platform, which we will be talking about today. So everyone talks about migrating to the cloud, and for some businesses, uh, there's some um, resistance to, to take that journey to migrate, um, especially in heavily regulated environments such as um, such as healthcare. Hopefully you can hear me better now. So there's some in, um, environments where um, migrating to the cloud is sometimes um, pushed back on, such as heavily regulated um, environments um, as, as we work in healthcare. However, uh, we made a strategic decision to move to the cloud um, about nine months ago. And some of the reasons were obvious. Agility, um, the significant cost savings of moving away from a, an on-prem infrastructure environment, um, being able to operate efficiently, uh, reducing the 
the um, IT compliance and the governance requirements going through um, all the various teams internally before you deploy a server, for instance, to being able to do those um, on the fly, still with some IT governance controls in place. Um, reducing our infrastructure footprint, which is a big thing for us. Um, we support dentists, and we, over time, um, started building out a significantly large and complex infrastructure footprint. And so we decided to focus on the dental applications, the clinical applications that we support, and less on the infrastructure footprint that we were building. And so part of our cloud adoption was looking to reduce that significantly. And in the end, we went from about 16 um, servers or 16 racks within our data center to just um, five um, with our cloud adoption. And we also wanted the ability to scale, um, to scale easily up and down to support our growing um, customer base without the need to invest. And from my standpoint, security has always been a key aspect of going into the cloud. Now, there is a debate on whether the cloud is more secure than on-prem. Um, I don't subscribe to that. I just believe that it's easier to get it right in the cloud because there are less touch points for you if you're managing your infrastructure effectively. And so that was our decision point, I guess, moving into the cloud um, all those months ago. And we're, we're now done with our initial cloud migration, and I'm going to talk you through that process and some of the benefits that we've realized from, from making that transition. So some of you may have seen this slide before. It talks about some of the key reasons why organizations move to the cloud, most of which I have talked about. Uh, we're six months into our cloud adoption, and we, we can say we've realized a lot of these benefits already. Our strategy to move is paying off. We have a more nimble, a more agile and adaptable um, environment. We're able to focus on the areas we want to focus on and also reduce our overall um, operating uh, expenditure. So I've talked about all the, a lot of the advantages of why we have made a decision to go to the cloud, but I just want to raise a few areas that you need to consider if you're looking to make this decision yourself. Um, the first is the speed of cloud adoption um, today outpaces the, the rate at which you can bring on competent talent to manage um, the cloud environment. And so if you're looking to go into the cloud, then you need to start planning ahead on the people side. You may be using your existing teams and so make sure they have the relevant certification. They go through the AWS training and certification program to ensure that they're ready um, to scale along with you as you take on your cloud journey. Security is another big area. Um, there's so many aspects of traditional on-prem security that you're able to translate into the cloud. What I have done here is simply highlight a few areas that I feel are most important. The first Thomas spoke about, which is understanding the shared responsibility uh, model. Going to the cloud doesn't mean you're outsourcing your security and your infrastructure somewhere else. You're still responsible for a large chunk of your environment, from day-to-day -day operations to your security, and understanding what role you play and where you hand off to AWS or third parties is critical for your success. Also, you've got to monitor your cloud environment like you do your on-prem environment. And that is not just monitoring your uptime and downtime. It's also monitoring your data. So having DL DLP controls, um, CASB controls that allow you to track your um, assets with, with access to them, where that information is being sent, all those things are very important. Um, having a single pane of glass as far as access is concerned, so implementing a single sign-on solution that gives you a single front door into your cloud infrastructure is critical to, to your success and something that you have um, to consider. The other option, uh, the other thing that comes up regularly is cost. Now, the cloud has a much lower barrier of entry, and I think this is um, clearly without debate in most quarters. However, your recurring costs can spiral out of control if you're not managing this effectively. 
And we'll talk about some of the visibility and some of the tools you can use to do this la um, later on. Um, I mentioned IT governance early on. Uh, if you think about if you're a traditional on-prem environment, there are lots of checks and balances that you have to go through before you can turn, you can spin up a server or install, you know, rack mount a server within the data center. All that somewhat disappears when you go into the cloud. Now anyone with a, with a purchasing card is able to spin up environments and if you don't have mature policies to manage that, then you, you risk getting to the end of the, the month or the end of the year and getting a significant bill shock. So taking traditional controls around change management and so on and transferring that into your cloud adoption journey is, is very um, is, is critical. Another thing people talk about is the ability to spin up and down uh, resources as you need them. That is absolutely true. But it's very easy for people to turn things on, and not a lot of people go back to turn them off when they're not using them. So you need that cadence in place to ensure that your teams are being uh, financially responsible as you look to um, move things um, along into the cloud. And finally, there's governance and control. We've talked about um, access management. The other aspect is asset management. It's very easy to go into a data center or go into a server room and tag all of the assets that you have. But as you start going from you know, one SaaS provider to one you know, infrastructure as a service provider like AWS or Azure or Google um, Cloud Platform, it becomes a little bit harder to track where your assets are if you don't have the right governance and control in place. There's also the need to comply, especially if you are in a regulated environment, as, as I mentioned earlier. Um, part of the, the webinar today, we will be talking about the Kaverin and Cyber Posture application, a platform that allows you to do compliance reporting and uh, analysis very easy on the fly across your cloud infrastructure. And we've also, I talked about your um, IT governance, so traditional governance controls, such as your technical review board, your change advisory board are all critical to your cloud success. So here at Pacific Dental Services, we started small. I mentioned we had um, 16 um, racks. We reduced that to five. Our approach wasn't to go entirely uh, cloud, um, you know, based in, in one go. So we started out by looking at what are those things internally that we don't need to have on-premise. One of the first things we did was looking at disaster recovery. Are there things on-prem today that we could uh, um, take advantage of the cloud to provide some type of disaster recovery rather than having our so-called DR in the rack next to the primary um, have them distributed in such a way that we, we truly have geo resilience in our disaster recovery and business continuity approach? So the first thing we did was build a data warehouse cluster using Amazon Redshift. Afterwards, we built a web application stack um, using Elastic Beanstalk and RDS. We migrated our remote desktop services cluster um, over to AWS and migrated our Atlassian tool suite. So that's Confluence, Bamboo, Jira, and so on. So a lot of the, the code uh, development that we do and deployment services, we all move that um, into the cloud. And then finally, there were some select legacy applications uh, that would have been cost prohibitive to, um, to change or to, you know, to migrate to a different provider. And so for those select applications, we simply lifted and shifted those into the cloud with a view of changing them in future as we look to upgrade our infrastructure and application stack. So the key, the key takeaway, I think, if nothing else, and we'll come to um, compliance in a second, is that you should start small. Prove out the theory uh, of the, the practicality of being able to move to the cloud first, and then as you get comfortable, as your staff ramp up in the knowledge, then you can then take a more aggressive um, approach to, to moving in, into the cloud. Um, just to give some realistic timelines, I guess, for anyone out there looking to do this, 
um, our entire process took about eight to nine months. Uh, the first one month was just working with um, some of our partners, looking at that strategy, making sure that we were happy with the various workloads that we had decided to migrate to the cloud. Um, so that took about a month to run through um, that phase. And then we went into proof of concept, which was just, again, um, having identified a workload and doing a few trial runs. We started out with some of our dev services. Um, you, you never want to go straight to your, your production instance. So we did that, um, got comfortable with it, um, went through the data mi uh, migration, um, moved our storage um, into the cloud, and then also sort of looking at uh, migrating particular applications um, into the cloud. And we're at the stage now where we're running and we're optimizing. There's still a few things that we are um, scaling up and down as we, we go on. There are so many additional services like um, Amazon CloudTrail uh, that Thomas spoke about, which we are looking to stand up. We didn't go out of the gate with every service uh, that Amazon had to offer, but as we mature through a process, we are looking to validate some of the controls we have and put on additional controls uh, where needed to um, bolster our uh, cloud security posture. So just running through some best practice um, tips here. Um, we, I talked about a shared responsibility model. That is very, very important as that dictates what you do, you have a very clear sense of your responsibility, and you can hold your team to account, um, and you can um, also um, um, hold Amazon to account um, on what their responsibilities are to you. The next is making sure you have clear visibility of your cloud workloads. You've got to look at your entire cloud environment like you would your on-premise um, environment. And if you cannot see it, if you can't measure it, then there's no way you can manage it. Identity and access management is key. If you think about all the various hoops you have to run through on a, in a traditional on-prem environment to get to your data resources, to your servers, and so on, in the cloud, you effectively have a front door that leads you in. And so if that's compromised, then your, the integrity of your cloud environment is, is clearly compromised. Um, single sign-on is critical. Um, having some type of multi-factor authentication is also critical. Um, you don't necessarily need to have MFA across the entire state. Uh, that is really down to you and your security and risk posture to see where you have critical assets and where you benefit from putting in your strongest security controls. And build in security into, in, from, from the onset, from the dev stage. Now, that is something that um, even we got cut out because we had a timeline to move from our existing data center. And so in some cases, we had to retrofit our security controls um, afterwards. Encryption is key. Ensure that your, your, your data is encrypted. Um, obviously, your, your um, data address and data in transit ensure your, your, everything from your browsers are being upgraded to support the latest and TLS versions. Make sure that as much as possible, data in transit and address is encrypted. Um, you can use VPNs. Those people would have a dedicated uh, VPN to ensure that you have um, that your, your transport layer at least has that level of security uh, assured. And finally, understanding your cloud risk posture. Um, if you think again about the um, correlating this to your on-prem environment, you run penetration tests, you run vulnerability assessments, you're obviously not able to run a full pen test within uh, the AWS environment. And so what you can do to complement that is make sure that you have some ability to see how vulnerable your application, your infrastructure is. And that's is where the Kaverin um, um, solution comes in because it allows you continuous reporting, a continuous visibility, continuous risk assessment of your environment. And you can tie that into some of the other monitoring tools and application platforms that you have in place. Um, so you're able to take action and you have you know, um, actionable intel on your cloud, um, cloud environment. So I'm going to hand um, over to the Kaverin team in just a minute to talk through their solution, but just a high level of kind of what we're using it for. 
So one, it integrates with CloudTrail. Um, if you remember a few slides ago, Thomas showed you the um, a CloudTrail log. Now, some people are fine reading that, and some people can go through pages and pages of, you know, um, of log information and can get out the relevant information. But for the, for the average um, security analyst or, um, or sysadmin, if they don't have the, the skill set to do that or don't have the ability to do that at scale, then you want to be able to feed those logs into something that is able to analyze and give you a consolidated view so you have a single pane of glass across your entire environment. You also have the added advantage if you're running a hybrid environment of being able to deploy the same solution across your on-prem environment. So you have a true single pane of glass across your traditional on-prem sort of data center space as well as your your um, Amazon uh, or Azure, whatever um, cloud provider um, you're using. And that, that's a very, um, a very powerful thing. It also goes away from your traditional vulnerability assessment where you're looking at CV scores and all of that. And it gives you simple numbers, risk. And a lot of um, senior level execs understand risk. And this gives you a score between zero and 100. And so over time, you can see whether you're improving in your security health or not. And it's a very easy way to, um, to measure your success and the effectiveness of the security controls that you've implemented. The second thing we get through the Kevin uh, Visibility and Compliance uh, platform is it gives you recommendations. So it doesn't just tell you if you have um, issues. It also gives you very simple one-line instructions on how you can remediate. And you can take that, you can export that into a CSV file or an Excel file. You can have that sent over to your sysadmin or your, your, net, your, you know, your network or DevOps teams to work on, or you can do a full one-touch remediation straight from the, the platform that allows you to then take um, action and then you know, continually measure your compliance to see if you have improved um, your cybersecurity posture. It also does its scans based on known security policy packs or security frameworks. In our business, we're more interested in HIPAA and high trust and, and, and obviously PCI and DSS. So I'm able to see my compliance based on standards without having to manually map my controls to the various standards that I have, I have to comply with. And if you are, if you try to sort of transcend the um, core hands-on security role and you go into more compliance audits and attestations and certifications, this is a time, um, a, a great time saver as you don't have to do all of that manual correlation um, um, offline. You can do that um, directly within, um, within the tool. You also don't require any agents. It, it will scan through your IP address range and um, it's able to get this information without the need to deploy um, agents. If you're like me and you have an agent for everything from AV to EDR to um, software license management, um, the thought of putting another agent on your endpoints that are probably running already slow isn't really something that I, a decision that I take lightly. So I, I like the fact that I don't have to worry about additional agents um, to, to be deployed. It's also cloud agnostic, so it works across AWS, so that's where the bulk of our services are. But if you're a Microsoft or a Google customer, um, that also will, will apply um, to your environments. And I've also talk, I talked about the fact that it works um, across all of the, the different um, um, service providers that you, you have out there. Okay, so just to wrap up here, um, some of the additional things. This is just an example, um, kind of tying all this together. Um, of what we're able to do, um, you have that risk posture. You're able to scan the IPs and um, port and protocols, as I've said. And I've just put here a quick example into kind of the visibility that this gives you. So in this case, it's telling me, you know, I need to ensure SSH connections are not open inappropriately. Uh, database ports are also not um, open without security justification. And any um, other critical ports are also not unduly um, open. Um, you don't want the ability for anyone to be able to scan your environment, right, without authorization. 
and you want to make sure that you're locking down the ports to just what you need to be able to perform your 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 day to day um, day to day task. And so the process is really simple to get to your cyber score. The first is discovering all of the assets that you have and all of the resources that you have within your environment. Once that's done, you need to do an assessment of the various threats. Um, these are done based on the various policy packs that you choose to implement. Um, so once you do that, it will identify any vulnerabilities um, within your environment, um, there will be some type of impact analysis um, based on the likelihood of that threat being exploited or that vulnerability, sorry, being exploited within your environment. And based on all of those variables, you then get a, a cyber score that you are then able to act on. And the fact that this happens continuously, you can then see whether you're trending upwards or uh, trending um, downwards. So... In summary, just before I hand over to, to Basham here, um, cloud migration is expected to be the norm for most organizations. I think traditionally the security um, industry has tended to um, resist rather than support um, their organizations in their quest to migrate to the cloud. But I think um, that approach is, is really uh, waning in most organizations. And we have to be part of the solution and not be a roadblock. Um, but that doesn't mean that you go into the cloud uh, blindly. You need to have a clear strategy. And people often make a cloud strategy look like something stupendously complex. It can be really simple. Everything from making sure that your staff are trained, identifying you know, what your data classification, your, your, your risk assessment, your risk tolerance is, what um, systems you're happy with going into the cloud, understanding the regulations within your various um, companies and industries, and there's certain things that may not be um, ready to go to the cloud just yet. But you need to have a very clear um, conversation with the various stakeholders. This is also not just an IT decision. This is going to be made as a business decision with the various um, stakeholders, um, making sure that they lend their voice to it. Because in some cases, you may impact the way their day-to-day -day workflow um, happens. And then you need to build in the appropriate security controls. There's so many security controls. You can argue every um, security control has a, um, a, a direct translation into your cloud journey, but that's focused in on just three. Right? The first is access, um, access management. So identifying who's got access, making sure that the access is appropriate to the resource that they're accessing, and putting in additional uh, multi-authentication factors where needed. Um, asset management, which is really about inventory management and continuous visibility. How do you know when your cloud environment is being scaled up or down? Is there an internal process before um, folks are allowed to add additional services? Those are the things that you need to be um, aware of. And then finally, there's the risk management. You need to have insights into your risk exposure and the vulnerabilities that um, you know, that presents themselves within your environment. There, there is no such thing as a zero risk or zero vulnerability infrastructure anywhere. And so being cognizant of this and ensuring that you're able to respond to um, the risk and vulnerabilities that you're exposed to is critical to your success. And the final part is just good old IT governance and change management, same rules apply, right? The fact that you're going into the cloud doesn't mean it's suddenly uh, people are able to bypass your internal governance and change review boards and do things um, off their own accord. You have to bring everything back through a change management calendar. And costs. Cost is something that I've put here as the last thing I want to talk about. Um, because a lot of times, cost is used as the main driver for going into the cloud, which in most cases is true. But if you don't manage it and you don't do all the other things that I've mentioned above, then you could get to the end of the year or whatever your period of measurement is and find out that actually you're, you're, you're costing your organization more by going to the cloud because you've just, um, so to say, opened Pandora's box. And so if you consider all of these things and put the right um, checks in place, then I think cloud adoption becomes less scary and more um, you know, easy for, for most organizations to, to undertake and do so successfully. Um, I'll hand over to, to Basham from Cavern to just run through 
the the Cavern um, product and talk, you know, he can then um, lead into any questions and answers um, you have during the time we have left. Hey, thank you so much, Nemi. So the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I want to go over a little bit of more detail with respect to what Thomas and Nemi talked about in terms of how Cavern helps you accomplish the kinds of security posture that uh, both of them are referring to. Now, when it comes to uh, cyber posture, what do we actually mean? So uh, you've probably seen screenshots in Nemi's presentation as well, but for a CISO of a large organization, the cyber posture dashboard that you see here on screen essentially helps them answer two questions. The first one is, how am I doing at this point in time from a security posture perspective? And as Nemi hinted at, we represent that security posture on a number between 0 and 100. 100 representing the least amount of risk for the organization. So most people that use this product are really around, uh, you know, they need to make representations to their board or C-level executives in terms of given the complex infrastructure in on-premises, AWS, and other clouds, how they're doing today. And that's what the cyber posture represents for them, a simple score that's easy to, quantify, that's easy to understand and, uh, you know, represent risk. The other thing that uh, CISOs can also understand from, this, from the dashboard is really a trend line in terms of how they're doing over time, right? So these numbers, again, a number between 0 to 100 may not be super meaningful to anyone, but a trend line that is, uh, that's based on a scoring methodology that's consistent will be significant in the sense that if you're going up or down, you have an idea in terms of, uh, in terms of is your posture improving or not. So that's the, uh, the CISO's view of the world, if you will. One level below the CISO, a security analyst can pinpoint where the problem areas are. So if I look at the, uh, what's shown on the dashboard right now, I see that my overall posture is 33, but then the asset group that's contributing to that low score is the one that's in the second panel, and it's, it's, it happens to be a group in the AWS uh, in, in my AWS account in Japan, right? So very quickly, from the high level, the analyst can drill down and say, okay, what's going on in my AWS group in Japan? And once they do that, the set of issues uh, that they can actually remediate is shown in the panel on the right-hand side, the prioritized issues. Again, we don't expect someone to work or manage changes for hundreds and hundreds of issues, you know, broken things. But what this approach does for you is that the scoring methodology ranks the most important things in the order of the improvement that they have on your site cyber posture. So as you interact with the dashboard, an analyst can quickly see that I have problems in AWS Japan and get the list of 25 things that they can do that has the most significant impact on their AWS Japan score, which then rolls up into their company level posture, if you will. The key, again, the key idea here is that you go from a top level view of cyber posture to actionable insight, and the scoring methodology and algorithm that I'll speak to in my next slide is really the underpinning for that way of approaching risk and uh, security posture. Now, how does the scoring, scoring actually work? Uh, Nami actually started talking about it at the high level. Uh, a few more building upon what he said, essentially that this, this framework is actually inspired by the NIST cybersecurity framework. So it has a basis in terms of how security experts view uh, risk management and risk scoring, if you will. The challenge that we have seen over the years is that there is no quantification, no one has done a quantification of something like the NIST cybersecurity framework. So although it's a great way to organize your thoughts, Ultimately, for a CISO or someone like Nami to make decisions on that framework, they need quantification, and hence the scoring approach. And as Nami mentioned, essentially six, six layers, if you will, going from, from top to bottom. The first part is really around discovering your resources, wherever they are. Cavern's approach tends to be an agentless architecture, so whether your, uh, whether your assets are in AWS or on-premises or Docker containers or what have you, we discover them all without an agent. And uh, in addition, as part of that analysis, you can actually assign a criticality to those resources as well, which might be based on confidentiality, integrity, and uh, 
availability types of analysis for your resources. Right? So that's the first level. The second level is really around threat, threat intelligence, if you will. Now, a threat is essentially uh, either, either a person uh, or a state actor or someone that wants to do harm to your business. And the idea here is that you can actually uh, discover the most important threats to your business from these external feeds, if you will, that you see listed here. Now, once you have an understanding of those, then the next step in the process involves identifying where your weaknesses are. Now, when it comes to weaknesses, what Cavern focuses on is, again, infrastructure weaknesses, but then they're more in two broad areas. The first is around configuration management issues, the examples that Thomas is giving you with respect to ports being left open in your security groups is a great example of that. And then vulnerabilities is where we would put uh, things like patches that are missing, uh, outbreaks of uh, you know, new, new vulnerabilities at the infrastructure level, and so on. No, those are your weaknesses. Your controls are basically what you can actually check against, and that's really where the, the, the so-called policy packs that we offer are really around technical controls that you can assess uh, known vulnerabilities or known configuration flaws against. Right? So those are step three and four. And then we have a way of actually estimating the likelihood based on a bunch of approaches. Uh, but generally, the kind of things that you can also think about are you know, historical trends around what you, you've been vulnerable to in the past. Um, vertical stats, like for example, if you look at the Verizon breach report that they publish every year, they have some insights into what, what are the kinds of weaknesses that certain industry verticals might have, financial services versus healthcare versus manufacturing and so on. Patching cadence could be another indicator with respect to likelihood and so on. So we again piece these things together and then the, uh, the impact analysis, again, as I said before, it's factored in as part of your resource visibility itself. But generally, what you're really looking for as, as it relates to impacts, when you, when you put, put these five, you know, your resources, your threats, your weaknesses, your controls, and the likelihood, ultimately what you're trying to understand is what's the impact on your business from, from a system downtime perspective, from a data breach perspective, and so on. Right? So you put all of these things together and then count with a, what we call a cyber posture score. And again, our approach is a proprietary approach, but the bottom line is that we're leveraging as many signals as we can, as many sensors as there are in your enterprise with respect to enriching this analysis and enriching the score so that it becomes comprehensive, meaningful, and then over a period of time consistent with respect to how you want to manage your infrastructure. Now, how, how do you actually deploy a cavern? So uh, the idea here is that cyber analysis is really valuable if you have a single pane of glass that gives you a 360 visibility into your entire infrastructure. And given that, many of our customers have like multiple approaches. So again, the reality is almost every enterprise is a hybrid enterprise, which means they have one leg in on-premises data centers, whether it's because of uh, you know, dev test type environments or legacy infrastructure that they have on-prem. And they have one or more clouds, including AWS. Now, the idea here is that in order for you to en enable a single pane of glass, you deploy Cavern, let's say in this example, in one subnet within AWS, and then establish connectivity between the Cavern subnet and, and the, the resources wherever they might be. The kinds of AWS services that you can use for connectivity from the AWS cloud into on-premises are listed here. Like, for example, you can set up VPN connectivity, or many large enterprises also use like something called Direct Connect, which is a service that connects legacy data centers or on-premises data centers into AWS with, with a dedicated connection. So all of those approaches. And then in our roadmap, you're also looking for you know, proxies and you know, bastion host support as well to establish connectivity. The bottom line here is that all of these approaches, which are really enabling connectivity from the cavern system, because it's an agent-less approach, to wherever your resources might be residing, and then doing the kinds of analytics that you saw on the previous slide uh, to, to, to build up the score in a comprehensive way. Uh, this, this particular slide actually talks about the compliance facts. Now, Thomas actually hinted at a bunch of best practices that AWS put together for HIPAA and PCI. 
and NIST. So in our framework, you will see among the compliance packs for AWS, we actually have uh, support for HIPAA and PCI as well. So you'll just see it as one of, I think, 27 or 28 policy packs in the system. Again, these are, again, technical controls and oriented towards specific regulatory requirements that you might be concerned about. A quick word on uh, monitoring. Again, I want to use an example that Thomas is using with respect to security groups in particular. Now, the way monitoring works in uh, Cavern, the reason you monitor anything is really to figure out, is there something going on in real time in your infrastructure that I need to pay attention to? So an example of uh, what Thomas mentioned is someone either accidentally or deliberately left a security group, a port in a security group open. Now, the way Cavern works is that we detect that through CloudTrail. So again, this is something that you have to establish within your AWS account. And from CloudTrail, we also have CloudWatch alarms that look for specific conditions that triggers on top of your CloudTrail events. And then, once, and then there is a Cavern Lambda function, which is actually monitoring the CloudWatch alarms itself. And that Lambda function, once it gets an alarm through CloudWatch, it actually triggers a policy assessment. So in the example of security groups, it's actually figuring out is this a good change or a bad change, right? So that's what the policy assessment is. If it is a bad change, that triggers an alert. So we publish an alert to a SMS topic, and then that gets picked up by the what we call the cavern control plane, which is then the way we process that particular alert and then make it part of the scoring algorithm, if you will. So that's sort of closing the loop. So the point here is you can have thousands of things going on in the infrastructure, and not all of them are really relevant to your business. Because we have controls in place that help us decide if it's a bad change or a good change, this, you know, this is what we call closing the loop from an alert to really understanding how it impacts your security posture. And uh, we believe we are one of the first to actually do it in this particular fashion. Now, simply alerting you isn't adequate. Alerting and scoring obviously is a way for giving you one level of insight. What this particular slide is talking about is how do you actually remediate should something go on. So this is a set second uh, workflow that, again, leverages a lot of AWS services under the covers. But the general idea is that uh, as, so again, we do not remediate automatically. We present the issues in a prioritized fashion, so that's step one. And then if the user chooses to remediate one, of, one or more of what we call failed policies, like in my example, if there is a security group that does need to be addressed from a posture perspective, that's what would get surfaced in the dashboard. And then from the dashboard, step one would be to create a remediation request, which was posted to an SNS topic. And then there is a cabin lambda function that's running in your AWS account, which is listening for remediation requests, if you will, and takes action on, on your AWS resources. Again, subject to your approval, of course. And then once it gets a confirmation from, from the underlying changes, it put, puts a message back on the simple hearing service, which is another AWS, top, uh, AWS service. And then Kazin, the control plane, which is really where the dashboard is running, picks up the confirmations from SQS and then processes it and then figures out if it impacts your score in a good way or a bad way, hopefully in a good way, and then you know, presents that to the user. So again, this is another example where we've gone from an alert to scoring that alert, surfacing the alert to the user in terms of a prioritized issue that requires their action, and then closing the loop with respect to remediation using Lambda functions. So with that, I want to pause here and hand it back to Dave for any remaining questions. Okay, Bashan, thank you very much. Uh, and Thomas, Nami, Bashan, thank you very much for your, uh, your, your detailed presentation. I think it was a lot of good information. Nemi, uh, one question came in that I, I think is directed to you. Uh, is the entire migration eight to nine months, or is there a, a longer plan? Yeah, um, good. Thanks, Dave. Um, so 
Our migration was, uh, the number one priority was moving out of our data center. That was the number one priority for us. So when I say eight to nine months, that was actually moving all of our data center footprints um, into the cloud, um, so AWS, or in some cases switching from um, providers that required on-prem and taking their cloud, so SaaS service providers, that took eight to nine months. Uh, there are other services that we had within our, um, you can call it our secondary data center, which is on site, right? And those services, we are going to migrate at a slower pace. So we set ourselves a date to clear out of one data center. We did that in um, nine months, including moving things into um, SaaS, um, you know, virtual providers rather than um, on-prem across the estate. Uh, that's the phase, uh, you could say, phase one and phase two of our migration journey. Okay, thank you very much, Nimi. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, Thomas, uh, any closing uh, comment from you? Yeah, uh, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, I'd just like to encourage everyone to uh, take a look at the materials I referenced in there, and if you have any questions uh, about cloud security and how we can help you, uh, please reach out. And Nemi, any uh, closing comment from you? Um, same thing, really. If if you want to know, I guess I kind of sit in the middle uh, using AWS and also Kaverine, so if you have any questions on how that journey has been for us, I'll, I'll be happy to, to respond as much as I can. So, uh, yeah, and thanks for, thanks for joining today. Okay, thanks again. And just two last notes. Uh, the Bright Talk folks will be uh, posting the complete webinar, including the, uh, the voiceover, uh, within the next hour. And then uh, we'll post a, a PDF of the presentation slides uh, amongst the uh, assets for this webinar as well. So once again, uh, thanks for everyone attending, and have a uh, great morning, uh, afternoon, or evening, no matter where you are.